Good morning, everybody. Um, before I uh, start today's committee, the whole meeting, just like to acknowledge that this land is traditional territory, meeting ground, gathering place, traveling route, at home for the Demesa, Nahiwak, Ashinabe, Sakamquik, Stony Dakota, and Metis. I'd like to call the um, Committee of the Whole meeting with the Jasper Municipal Council to order. Today is Tuesday, October 11th, and the time is 9.31. Are there any additions that anyone would like to have to the agenda today? Directions, deletions, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Devoto. Just under uh, agenda item six, correspondence. Just an oral bit of advice concerning some correspondence that I received too late for the agenda. Well, uh, call that 6.1. Any other additions? All right. With the approval of edition 6.1, uh, Mayor Ireland's correspondence, uh, may have a motion to approve the agenda. Councillor Hall, all in favor? That's carried. Agenda item four, the September 27th Committee of the Whole Minutes. Are there, is there business arising from the minutes? We don't need to improve that here, right? So we that. Your Worship. I just had uh, one question under correspondence um, section of the agenda. It's indicated as number 404 slash 22 on the minutes. I think it's the second page in about the middle. There is a motion by Councillor Wilson that's recorded. And I I haven't gone back to listen to the tape, but I, I'm not sure that the committee can direct council to do things. They can recommend that council do things. Um, and so there, although we received a presentation at the committee of the whole at a regular council meeting that afternoon, and the motion was that council add that matter to the regular meeting for the afternoon. It's, it's a small matter, but I think it points out the fact that we have a need to be more selective in our words when we make motions, because I'm not sure that even if that was the motion that Councillor Wilson made and we voted on it, I'm not sure that it accurately depicts what we can be sitting as a committee. We can recommend to Council, but we can't direct Council. I just, I draw that to your attention and I don't know whether it's, it's the minutes themselves that are in error or our motion, but it's something to do with it. Thank you, Your Worship. It also goes to show how thorough you are in reviewing our documents, so I appreciate that as well. Can I be any more obsequious? <laughs> that was not a question. Just admiration. All right. Um, is there any other business arising from the minutes for today or from the 27th of September? Okay. Well, that brings us to agenda item. Five, delegations. We have Ms. Robbins here from Community Futures West Yellowhead. Look forward to hearing from you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nancy Robbins. I'm the general manager at Community Futures West Yellowhead. 
Uh, Community Cookies by Shell Head is a federally funded non for profit organization which administers Prairie's Economic Development Canada's Community Cookies program. For those of you that don't know, Prairie's Economic Development Canada is known as Prairie's Can, or formerly known as Western Economic Diversification. Our primary role in the region is to promote small business growth. We do this through business coaching, training, financing, and community economic development. Our region is on Treaty 6 and Treaty 8 lands covering Jasper, Jasper National Park, Hinton, Edson, Grand Cache, all the surrounding cooperatives and enterprises in the MD of Greenview, as well as Yellowhead County. Our biggest challenge is our biggest opportunity. We have a very large region, but also we have one of the diverse economies in the entire province. And so we're grateful that we're able to work in all the industries in the working in Alberta, and uh, we're a very busy office because of it. As you are aware, we're owned by the five municipalities that we serve, and we appreciate the contribution that that makes to our organization. Before I continue, I want to mention that uh, Councillor Keller MB was with us for nine years. The majority of what you see in this presentation today was led uh, with her as chair of the organization, and we cannot uh, move forward talking about the pandemic without her Mentorship, mentorship to both myself and to the staff and for all the work that she did for us in the pandemic. You can go to the next slide, Emma. So our immediate response in March 2020 is we went home like the rest of the uh, entire world, uh, expecting a two-week closure. And we took uh, all our equipment home and spent practically three weeks on the telephone. If I could say anything about this time period, it was that we said, I don't know quite a bit. Um, called a lot of people back, uh, answering questions, learning about a lot of federal government acronyms like SUS and SIBA and RRF in order to answer everybody's questions. And it was really different for us. And mm -hmm. a lot of the takeaways that we had um, during this moment was that, number one, we did not realize how much we were responsible for the mental health of our clients. And so we had a lot of conversations uh, about what that would look like and how we could get a lot of other people involved in our organization and the work we did because we weren't trained to deal with a lot of what we were seeing. And number two, we did a three-month no interest period on our loan portfolio. Uh, we didn't take any interest, didn't charge any interest, and didn't take any payments for three months. We knew at the time this was going to have a long-term impact on our cash flow moving forward in three to five years, and we're kind of seeing that right now. Um, when you don't take any revenue for a three-month period, it was very difficult for us, and we're starting to see the effects of that now. And also, um, we quickly had to learn how to virtual coach. We had always depended on face-to-face -face interactions like the rest of the world, and so we radically changed the way our organization worked. And so um, we moved on to the release stage in June 2020. And if um, if we could say anything about the immediate response stage where our mantra was, I don't know, I think in the, the year following June 20 to 21, we kind of went, well, I didn't see that coming. Um, I think as an organization, we could do more than anything. We had to learn a lot about restrictions. We had to learn how to implement them and to understand them. We had to understand why certain industries were being targeted and others weren't, and we didn't have a lot of questions for people. Uh, we wanted to model the behavior in our office, so we implemented any restrictions that our offices had to implement, such as vaccine, vaccination passports. Um, and our organization grew. We uh, put in two remote offices, one in Grand Cash and one in Edson. Uh, this enabled us to keep the staff safe, and we also then were able to have someone boots on the ground in both our outlying communities from Hinton and Jasper to enable us to uh, work directly with our business community and then take away that safety of, of keeping everybody safe. So two of the main things <clears throat> we did in the relief stage, one was the business walks. Um, business walks were conducted as an economic development tool that were strategic in its focus. Every business that is visited is, has the same questions and they're asked for consistency. Many of you have participated in business walks with us, and so you know that they are very rewarding. They became a very important tool in this pandemic because what we saw was every time we would go out, we would see a different issue. 
And we learned that very quickly that as soon as we got information that um, that information became outdated six months later. To give you an example, in August 2020, the main themes that we saw were shop local, advertising and marketing assistance, and financial assistance. Flip that to a year later in August 2021, the main issues were labor shortages, supply chain issues, and digital access. And, and in our work, in economic development, things don't change that quickly. You kind of have to put in a lot of effort to get the long haul. So when things are changing in a six to 12 month period, it's very, it was very difficult for us to be uh, able to do programming. However, we found the business works really well, worked because uh, businesses really appreciated us coming to them. They no longer had to make like, the time to come to us, we went to them. And so um, we're doing business walks this month in October and November. We're going to focus on the downtown revitalization theme in all our communities, if anyone wants to join us. I've included some information on our regional lease and recovery fund because I, I want to talk about how it was one of probably the biggest challenge our organization has ever faced. And we've been an organization for 35 years. It was mirrored on the SEVA program. It was originally designed to fit those that were ineligible for SEBA, either they were sole proprietors, their revenue was too low, or their uh, revenue was too high to qualify for the SEBA. It soon became a parallel program, and we did never anticipated how big it was going to be. We did 141 applications in six months, and if you've ever sat on our loan committee, you know how big a deal it is to get 141 loan applications. So of those 141 applications, 109 were approved, 27 were declined, and five were withdrawn by the client. In total, we lent out $3.5 million in a short time <clears throat> month period in the West Yellow Head. And if we look at provincially, Alberta was the biggest program in the country. Uh, Alberta alone lent out $85 million. I've included some statistics on what Jasper looks like. <coughs> um, if you look like at Jasper, Jasper was the uh, biggest uh, proponent of the Triple R effort, 35% of our loans going to Jasper, which totaled $1.2 million. And also, if you look in terms of industry, I can't divide the community down by industry. It would be too telling and we would know right away who had what loan. But if you look in terms of uh, who was actually applying for RRRF loans, you'll see that um, arts, entertainment, and recreation was one of the highest, which is one of the most of the, the businesses that are sole proprietors or home-based businesses in Jasper are fitting into. And also professional uh, science and technical, you'll see that, that as well. We also had a tremendous amount of farmers um, that were unable to get assistance elsewhere. And so in Yellowhead County, uh, the farmers that were on the east end of the county were really active in our program. And we ended up finding a lot of different clients than we normally have as community future. So now we're in the recovery mode. And if I could go from, um, I don't know, to, well, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I think I'm going back to, I don't know. Because frankly, we don't know what we don't know, but we have a few certainties moving ahead over the next two year period, what we anticipate to happen for the next three to two years. Number one, small businesses in the West Yellowhead are not prepared for any kind of business interruption or any kind of closure in the recovery mode of the pandemic. Moving forward, we are planning to have coaching and training sessions on just that, preparing for business interruptions. We know our economy is still recovering and we need to support our small businesses as much as possible to ensure that any kind of closure or interruption to businesses is understood and that they are stressful, that there, there is engagement and support to our businesses navigating uncertainty. We have found that small business owners have a unique trauma from the pandemic and that their stress is unique from anyone else's. Their needs are unique and they need to be identified as such. Second of all, we're coaching more about cash flow now than wow. ever before. It used to be business plans were our number one way of coaching. Now we talk about cash flow all the time. We do know that recovery is taking longer than expected. We're heading into 2023. We can expect to see a global recession. And at the end of December of 2023, all the businesses have to pay back their triple RF and SIBA loans. So we're going to have a tremendous amount of pressure on cash flow and capital and access to that capital in the next 18 months. 
Digital access is a tool coming out of the pandemic that every business needs to have. We've been fortunate enough to partner with Business Link on our Digital Services Squad program, and we have someone in our office for the next six months that's dedicated just to digital access. Can't stress enough that people still want curbside, they still want to order online, they still want to do it. If businesses are not implementing this into their business, they need to do it soon. Number four, businesses are going to close, and we have to be okay with that as a community. They're closing their businesses for a host of reasons, and every business closure is unique. Frankly, most that have not survived during the pandemic has been because of the tremendous financial and the personal strain and stress of the pandemic over the past two years. But with the bad news, there's good. We've seen a higher number of startups in the West Shallowhead than we've ever seen before. So entrepreneurship is alive and well. It's just really, really changing because of the pandemic. And lastly, the nature of work has changed in the pandemic. Labor shortages and working from home have drastically impacted our economy, and they have changed the way small businesses operate in our region. We need to address this issue moving forward in a strategic way that is beneficial to both employers, employees, and small businesses. So what are the next steps? In the next six months, I'm going to come back to you and talk about two major pro projects that we currently have underway. We are involved in a RRRF project that will do a needs assessment and a gap analysis of all the recipients in the program in the province. So we are working on that. So that is finding out what the gaps are of these businesses that actually access capital in the recovery, in the relief stage, and what they need moving forward. Second of all, as you're fully aware, you're one of the municipalities that are partnering with us in the regional business expansion program in the entire West Shallowhead. That program right now is in the field, and we will understand from the project the post-pandemic needs of our, each of our municipalities and how those needs are unique and we understand regionally when we move forward. As with anything we've learned in this pandemic, all information and data helps us find solutions for our small businesses to be successful and to survive the recovery mode for the next couple of years. Thank you for taking the time for listening to our experience in the pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Robbins. I can certainly uh, appreciate having to go through some loan applications. Um, I think the most I've ever experienced was maybe four at the max, and that takes the better half of a day, half a day. Anyway, so 147 sounds monumental. So I appreciate everybody's efforts and work that went into that. Just want to make sure I'm talking loud enough. All right. Uh, does anyone have any questions on Nancy Roberts' presentations? Councillor Malik. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Demora, and, and I'll ask a question. Um, and it may not be within community futures, and I might see to administration if they can answer um, a question about the status currently of our Alberta rural renewal application. Is Community Futures part of that with the um, FCSS or with the the pro with um, um, our efforts through uh, Jeanette Brigon? We work behind the scenes with uh, Jeanette Marcoux at the Jackson Employment Education Center, but I believe it has come to council through her organization. We just were support to her in getting that application in. Uh, thank, thank you, Deputy Mayor, uh, through the Council Melnick. So, Miss um, Perdon did announce that, that we were accepted as a community under that uh, rural renewal stream. So, that program is open and eligible for um, employers to apply to. You. And really, uh, as uh, Ms. Robbins indicated, they, they should speak directly to uh, Ms. Ms. Perdon over that, uh, or Marku. I think I'm mixing that up. I apologize. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that program is, uh, we are now an eligible, eligible community, so we were successful in that application uh, under, under Jeanette's uh, leadership there. So anybody who's interested, any employer who's looking to fast track um, an employee through that program would go to the Deaf Employment Education Center. 
And thank you both for that. I think that um, there's so many programs that have been available and are winding down. Sometimes uh, individuals and businesses in the community aren't sure which agency to go through. So I appreciate that clarity. And we all work together. So when someone comes to us, we know where to send them. Mm -hmm. I like your quick attempt at autocorrect. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Hall. Thank you, Deputy Mayor uh, Demota. I have a couple questions for you. The remote offices in Grand Cash and Edson, will those remain open? Uh, we've had a change of staffing in Grand Cash, so no to Grand Cash. And we still are going on here almost year four in Edson. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, my other question, have you had businesses reach out from Jasper because of the Tedman fire? And that SEBA is a loan? Yes. Would that apply for some of the businesses in Jasper that were affected by the fire? No, the SEBA loan is uh, part of the regional, the pandemic recovery that is no longer open for applications. Uh, yes, we've had quite a few businesses that have reached out to us and are, we've just listened and helped with answering questions, um, helping them with the wording of their insurance and how to talk to insurance companies. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Your worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Robbins, for your report and um, for your assistance to communities in the region through the pandemic and, and beyond and continuing. I, I did have a couple of specific questions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that early on in the pandemic, uh, Community Futures West Yellow had, I think, waived, waived interest or deferred interest? Waived it. She so didn't for, charge it. Right, for the first three months. Uh, for the three months that everyone was closed, yes. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is just foregone revenue to Community Futures? Yes. And was Community Futures able to make that decision internally, or are there federal jurisdictional rules that require approval for that? Yes and no. Uh, we work for a board of directors who is responsible for the loan portfolio, so it was their decision to make. However, it was highly recommended by the Provincial Association, and WG, who is now first hand, also made the recommendation. We um, did a lot of consultation with the other offices in the province as we wanted to be on par with what they were doing. And it became a common thing for the office yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, one of the acronyms that we use is the triple RF yes. loans. Um, so there are a number of those out, it sounds like maybe 38 or so in Jasper. What did you say were the repayment requirements for those loans? So that is a, the original loan was a $40,000 loan. And if it's repaid back by December 30, 2023, it will be 10% uh, or $10,000 is forgiven on that 40,000. So then if they applied for the 40,000 and were eligible, got that loan, they could apply for an additional 20,000. Uh, we call that our, you know, extra expansion loan. And for that $20,000, uh, if the $40,000 is paid back, 50% of that will be forgiven. So clients have a $60,000 debt of which they would have to pay $40,000 by December uh, 2023. If it's not paid back by that date on January 2024, it becomes a $60,000 loan at a 4% rate. Now that 4% rate is unique. We're finding out from the our mainstream banks that for the people that have the sister loan, the SIBA loan, the Canada Emergency Business uh, Account, that is going to be prime plus 2%. And understand that by the time January 2022 hits or 24 hits, prime could be 10%. So, that amount for both programs needs to be paid back in a two-year period. So we are working with our clients right now to really discuss, that's why we're really focusing on cash flow. We're trying to get them to pay it back early because we understand that the majority of us are not going to be able to pay back $60,000 plus interest in a two-year period. Um, and so we're really encouraging 
And it, even if they're not a client of ours, we're working with them to figure out how to do that before December 31st of next year. Thank you for that. Um, and then finally, you you mentioned um, that businesses are not prepared for more business interruption. Right. Um, I was wondering, in terms of coaching that you know, Futures West Sullivan provides, um, whether there is an element of coaching with respect to business interruption laws, because even though I, I understand emotionally and economically, um, business interruption is something um, that businesses are not prepared for. Mm -hmm. It may yet come. Um, the the fire that we just experienced with the power outage should not be considered a one-off. Um, I think businesses have to look at business interruption, whether it's, of course, it's never desirable, but mm -hmm. it, it might be a reality. So I'm, I'm just wondering, um, the extent um, that we might be able to provide coaching on that matter and whether there might be anything that we can do to assist um, to prepare people for something that um, is, of right. course, highly undesirable, but we should, I think, position our community to be prepared regardless. And, and the reality is we're not unique. Um, we've seen this happen to businesses in Slave Lake, Fort Mac, and the, the floods. Uh, in the south, and also um, there's a tremendous amount of work being done by our neighbors in British Columbia in the northwest with returns to disaster recovery, and they're they're similar to Jasper in a lot of respects in terms of fire threat. Um, I think moving forward, we need to really start talking about disaster recovery and disaster recovery preparation and what that looks. I mean, we know as a reality of that when a community evacuates, it's a minimum of 30 days sometimes before people get back. And so uh, businesses need to, I think we need to have more open conversations about what that looks like. Um, and Jasper is not alone. I mean, the whole region needs to be prepared for it. So it is on our radar. There is some work that we are hoping to do within terms of disaster recovery for everybody um, in terms of what it means for business communities. So hopefully, in the new year, we'll start working on that. Thank you for that. And one final question, if I may. Um, whatever Western economic diversification became Prairie's Can, um, what is the federal department that funds Prairie's Can? Uh, their um, economic development and innovation, I believe, it has changed again. Um, I believe that's what it is. Whatever, for the first time in Community Futures nationally, all the regional development associations are under one umbrella. Um, so it's been very interesting to watch that as we're hearing a lot more about uh, how the grass is greener on the East Coast and that kind of thing. Uh, but whatever the economic development, the innovation, I, I can't tell you exactly what the name of the department is. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I'd like to thank you for your report and uh, and how concise it is and clear. And there's a lot of information in in a short package. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to to thank you personally. And I think our region is uh, that much more healthy because there's a lot of behind the scenes work that you do that I don't think you get enough credit for. Uh, so I think our region's a lot healthier and stronger because you pour back a lot of things. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Right. Trying to be as efficient as possible here, Council Melnick. So that brings us to uh, agenda item five, delegation, or sorry, agenda item number six, correspondence uh, 6.1. Mayor Ireland, you wanted to uh, add something? I did. Thank you, Deputy Mayor DeMota. In consideration of <laughs> Councillor Melnick's timelines, I, I will be quick as well. Uh, I received a phone call late on Friday uh, just asking a number of questions about um, assessments and not so much the, the assessment, but the, the means of updating assessments. So, as we know, our assessor assesses 
one fifth of the town every five years, approximately. And so the people who live in that area get a questionnaire. Uh, and this particular resident indicated that that resident and others were concerned about what they considered to be somewhat intrusive questions on questionnaire. Um, and an apparent disconnect between uh, what the Assessor Act asks and what the Development Authority, which in our case is Parks Canada, should already know the people are applying for development permits as they should, then most of the information that the assessor was looking for should all be in, already be a matter of record. Anyway, I draw that to your attention um, simply because it seems to me that those might be avenues of questions for our assessor next time the assessor visits. And the real question then is to administration and not requiring an answer today, but can we be informed when we might next expect to have our assessor present and would it typically not be until next spring, which is a very long time for me to try and retain the information that I received on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Malachuk has stepped up here to answer your question. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. It's good to come um, to your worship. Um, yes, uh, at, at any moment, if you would wish to have um, him come in and do a presentation, or um, if there's any other questions, then definitely we can arrange for something. It doesn't have to wait until his normal time that he comes in to present. And um, um, and what you're alluding to is a request for information, and um, there are some legal implications behind what the assessor is allowed to ask, and yes, he is allowed to ask those questions, and um, it is mandated that if if that if those properties are requested of that information, that they, sh they have to, it says within the regulations that they must reply. If they do not reply, um, then it just removes some ability to um, contest or uh, uh, not appeal, but or complain about their assessed values going forward. So it's um, it's very it's a way to uh, for them to be able to have the most accurate information as possible, allowing them to assess that property at a fair um, value um, because um, there there could be some changes that may have not been communicated um, down the road and that, it, that is um, the reason for that request for information. But he can definitely come in, um, I'm sure, at any given moment to uh, do a presentation. Well, thank you for that. I, I very much appreciate it. And it, it adds some real clarity and context to the issue. So with that, I can potentially direct the resident or maybe residents <clears throat> Um, to their MLA as well, because the the rules that govern our assessor are set by the province, not by us. And so he has to follow provincial law. And if the resident is concerned that the provincial law is intrusive, then the resident maybe has to speak with the, the MLA or other provincial authorities. So I appreciate that response. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and just for clarity, thank you, Your Worship, and, and Ms. Malachek. Um, you know, uh, assessments have a collective effect on each other in their areas. So, um, you know, the information that's provided is helpful to your neighbors and you know people down the street. So, um, that's that's why that's important as well. So, if assessments go up or down, that has an effect on your property. Okay. <laughs> All right, appreciate that. Um, that brings us to the next uh, agenda item, uh, seven new business. Uh, we have 7.1 SBOP pocket. <laughs> it's not a pox, it's parking. S block parking. Is that on? Would you like to leave that, please? Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor DeModa. I, I'm afraid I have to admit this was the longest standing item on the motion action list, and it is here today. 
for discussion. Um, so that motion came to us last fall, and it was to bring back a discussion, a policy level discussion about S block parking. So the parameters were somewhat broad. Um, therefore, we decided to address uh, sort of the three types of parking that are currently available in the area. And as you can see in the report, um, administration has a recommendation that uh, committee direct administration to develop a residential winter parking program for the vacant stall in the S block parking lot. So that is the new lot that is located by the train tracks. And we are also recommending that uh, committee direct administration to propose a fee increase for the storage lots. And that would be through the storage lots bylaw. Um, and essentially under background, there's a map showing uh, the different areas and what they're used for. And so the storage lots, uh, there's a long history of the municipality operating those and they are for residents and mostly uh, consist of RVs and trailers, rec recreational trailers. and um, and we have a storage lots bylaw, which sets out the cost and all the fees and penalties associated with that service. Uh, additionally, the new parking lot, which we refer to as the S block parking, uh, was developed in, in 2019 and started operating in 2020. And that is also the responsibility of the bylaw enforcement service to manage the agreements for that area. And, um, and then additionally, parking in S-Block more generally, it is our main industrial area. So there's lots of commercial vehicles out there. And there are a few challenges as outlined uh, in the report, including not all properties are fenced. There is no white line on the street. So sometimes determining exactly where vehicles are is a bit of a challenge for bylaw. Um, but certainly they have a good working relationship with operators in the area and when something arises, we try to contact them and go for compliance as opposed to enforcement. And um, it is largely complaint driven. We do keep an eye out and they do patrol the area, but that is where that sits. So under discussion, we are proposing a few things. Um, I'm, I could take you through it, but I'm also happy to take questions, but essentially the S block parking lot is not seeing the use that we would like to see. And I think that was part of the prompt to get this report in front of council. And there are opportunities that we could use it a bit differently. And that's what we are proposing here to increase usage and increase the services to residents and increase revenue potentially. And then the storage lots, um, the leases on the storage lots have been expired since 2019. And at the time, there was a discussion for annual renewals with Parks Canada. And I think part of the discussion was that, should that be a service that the municipality keeps offering or not? And that is very much a conversation that is one for council to have. So we tried to provide some information in here as to what the possibilities are and the requirements if we decide to con continue operating them. And I think that captures what we wanted to bring forward. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Well, councillors are assessing what they'd like to ask. I, I would like to leave with a question. I'm trying to speak last, but uh, I wish I, we had uh, Councillor Keller Rappi here, and, and I might have to lean on, on the mayor a little bit. From my recollection, I believe at one point, that there was some funding money or grants available and we saw a need uh, to remove or at least have some enforcement opportunities on our streets and in S block and decided to go with the development of this uh, project specifically to clean things up for um, equipment and uh, commercial vehicles within the community. And we knew at the time that there was going to be a challenge with enforcement and compliance. And uh, but where I felt like we were assured that this was going to be a successful um, project. And um, I'm not putting the blame on anybody else. I just wanted to know um, you know how we ended up here with um, you know the mass amount of vacancy. And, and I do understand from the report that was given um, the challenges, but um, and, I, and I understand that we've had, we've had a change in, in administration too. And 
maybe that directive is changed as well. Thank you. Is it open? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Demota. I think um, your your question or the way you're framing your approach here uh, speaks to the commercial use of the lot, which is something that when we reviewed the information and the formal directions we had from council, the only motion that we have on file for the use of the parking lot designates parking for community members. So internally, we've asked ourselves the question, when did this become a commercial parking lot? Because that is how we promote it. That's how the application forms are. That is the way it operates. And um, that was back in, in the time when we didn't, council didn't pass motions at committee of the whole. So perhaps that direction was provided verbally, but not captured through our documentation. But that is why we're um, proposing a change in use that could target or that could become a service for residential users for winter storage. And then uh, turning the vacant stalls into paid parking for the summer would would provide alternative uses. However, if the council's sense on this is still that it should be commercial and that compliance and enforcement in town in general should be increased to drive uh, people to rent those stalls is, is a bit of an interesting situation for the bylaw team to be in, as in they are enforcing something that we are then charging a fee to come use a service that's administered by the same department is an interesting premise for them to, to go out there with. But certainly uh, that could be an outcome of today's discussion that uh, council's wish would be to continue using that parking lot as a commercial parking and attempt to increase usage just by increasing enforcement in town, in, in S block, but also in town. And um, so that is one option that could potentially increase commercial usage. I think the other aspect to consider is the cost. I think for a lot of businesses, $150 a month is not necessarily an expense that they want to consider. And therefore, if we were to increase the usage to residential users as well, if businesses are not willing to pay $150 a month, there's a very, there's kind of a low chance that, that residents will for their private vehicles, right? So, um, the cost recovery fee for this parking lot at the time was calculated at, at $450 a month would be the cost that we would need to charge to recover the cost of the asset. As you mentioned, Deputy Mayor DeModa, there's been some grant funding, so it's not necessarily all municipal money that went towards this. Um, but certainly we're, we're open to hearing some council direction on the, on the purpose of that lot and from a policy level, how you would like to see it operate. And we can take that back and develop proposals accordingly. Right. I appreciate that. You know, I look at the price of, of, of a commercial lot and then also, uh, you know, what it costs to rent a storage locker in town. And I think for the size of the lot and what you're getting, um, you know, for a vehicle, uh, from the work that went behind that, and I have to, you know, um, commend Mr. Jones for the uh, information that he brought forward. And I think that's a it's a pretty reasonable price. It, different businesses might differ, uh, but you know, that's all up and on affordability. Um, I I know that there there was only one motion that we could find on this, but I I'd also like to see what recommendations came forward to council at the time as well as we have one here today. Because I am still under the impression that the intent was to uh, clean up commercial vehicles and equipment off of our uh, streets. And, and I think that maybe the foresight at the time, uh, it was designed, set up, the motion was for community members saying that we might be here today. So um, I commend council for, for the task for having that foresight. Councillor Mellon, if you gave me a nod, you'd like to. Speak to this. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Demota. I have a series of questions for more for information and understanding, um, just to make sure that that I'm getting the whole picture of the industrial area parking situation. So we have seven lots. It looks like that are storage lots, and we rent. Uh, space there at three hundred and nineteen dollars annually. Is that correct? So somebody parks there, they pay three hundred and nineteen. But if they park in our new facility, they're charged the equivalent of 
eighteen hundred dollars a year. It's one hundred and fifty a month times twelve, being eighteen hundred, and it seems like a wide discrepancy, which is maybe why we only have one quarter of that lot rented. Um, I wasn't on council when the um, when the fees were set up. Uh, so, you know, there may be an opportunity for us to review the fees in both the seven lots. Is that too low? And in the new lot, are the fees too high? Um, because in the end, we want to provide a, a service to our community and still generate revenue. Um, so do I have all that, that? I'm understanding everything there correctly, right? Thank you, Deputy Mayor DeMoto, through the Councilor Melnick. Um, yes, that, that is accurate, and that is part partly why one of the recommendations in, in the report is to <clears throat> committee direct administration to review the fees on the storage lots bylaw, uh, considering that we have, I think, 95 stalls available, which are all full, and 65 names on the waiting list sort of suggests that there might be an ability to increase the fee here and that people would still be interested in the in the service, the your assessment on the fees is accurate. The only difference is that currently we only accept commercial applications for the S block lot, as opposed to the uh, storage lots are all private use. So in um, private trailers, RVs, could be vehicles, as long as it's something that's insured and roadworthy is the is the criteria. So residential versus commercial use. And yes, the fees are, are quite different and could be adjusted to yield different benefits. Thank you, appreciate that. And, and you mentioned a, a fee or cost of $450 per month. Is that to maintain the new parking lot? And is that for the entire lot or is it per stall? I think I'm trying to, I, I don't have a, a context for that comment of the $450. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, that is from the previous reports on the development of the lot and essentially from an asset management perspective, if we wanted to fund the renewal of that lot over its lifetime, we would need to rent each stall for $450 a month to recuperate the cost of the asset over its lifetime. So it's from an asset management perspective was the the initial calculation, but um, at the time it was recognized that 450 might be a bit steep for, for usage. And as we see now, it's 150 um, for the smaller stalls. And there are two stall lengths in the S block parking lot. And the other, so it's 150 a month plus GST for a 22 feet long stall, but there are also 38 feet stalls, which are 200 a month. So there's two different prices there. But yeah, so the 450 was in the context of asset management. If we were to repay for that asset over the course of its lifetime, we would need to charge 450. Thank you for that. And if I may, one last question. I, I do see activity on the west side of that lot um, where there is um, pieces of equipment and ground being broken. Is that an extension to that lot or does that have something to do with uh, uh, wastewater or, um, and you may not know the answer. Just It's been interesting over the past 10 days to see that activity there. Deputy Mayor DeMoto through the Councillor Melnick, I think I know that that is the Sandy Dump. It is the project to update our, our Sandy Dump, which was grant funded, which I know the funding was just extended, and that's in that same area. Thank you for all the information. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Melnick. Thank you, Ms. Nadal. Councillor Hall, you have a question? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Zamoda. Again, just for clarity, and thank you, Councillor Melnick, for asking all the questions I had as well. 
so commercial vehicles cannot park in the storage lots of just the private residents. And so you're saying $450 per lot per month over the year would maintain the lifetime of that lot. Deputy Mayor DeMoto through the Councillor Hall, that is for the paved parking lot in S Block, so the new asset. Um, and part of the challenges we're having with the private or the residential, I guess is the best way to put it, residential storage lots is that the level of service there is quite different, as in um, they're not uh, level or graveled or the stalls are not marked. And um, if the municipality is to continue operating those storage lots, certainly from an asset management perspective, we would be looking at uh, investments needed in those properties to maintain a, a level of service versus um, the stalls are, I want to suggest, bigger in uh, the S block parking lot. They are paved, they're easier to get access to. Um, another difference is that the residential storage lots are fenced and locked. So if you have your travel trailer in there, it should also be locked, of course, but there's that sort of extra level of, of security. So the service is a bit different in, in each area. Thank you for that. Um, so that works out to roughly like $330,000 a year when, when you multiply those numbers. What is the lifetime of that lot or what is? That one, I'm afraid I would need Mr. Greathead or Mr. Hutton to speak to it from an asset management perspective. And, and that's also a reflection of how we operate. So the operations department is responsible for the asset management and the maintenance and the snow removal and the line painting and, and all that kind of stuff versus the bylaw department operates the service and the facility and looks after the rental agreements, payments, things like that. But we can, we can, if there's an interest from council to know more about the asset life cycle and cost, we can certainly provide that information. Just one last question. Right now there's 15 out of 61 spaces rented. Have we at times had more than 15? And are those Spaces are there plugins for electricity, or are they just, it's just a, a lot? Deputy Mayor Demoda through the Councillor Hall. I don't believe there are outlets that is um, to be confirmed. I don't think so, but I can find out. And um, I think the usage is pretty much as high as we've, as we've seen it. And I also think that there was a um, there was a change in ownership or a change in practice in another area that drove a certain number of stalls to be rented in the last year or two. So, so changes in business premises and access to parking for commercial vehicles is very subject to what happens in the private sector and it might create a demand for our stalls. Um, but certainly, if people have other options that are less costly, that's what they've been doing, right? And I think that's what explains why there's such low usage in that commercial law. Thank you, Councilor Hall. Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor DeMondi. I do have a plethora of questions, um, but I'm sure they'll all get answered. Uh, my recollection is similar to Councillor DeModa, Deputy Mayor DeModa, that the initial impetus for this lot was to provide an option so that storage of equipment, particularly commercially related equipment on residential streets, would have some other place to go. And so if the record shows community use rather than commercial. Um, I expect that that reflects an intent that this was not intended to be another RV visitor parking lot. It was for community use, although my recollection is that the community use was targeted toward commercial, which is all reflected in, in what we've done. And so the idea was that there's lots of equipment, or at least we were that I believe there was lots of equipment parked on public streets throughout town um, because there wasn't any option available to put it elsewhere. 
I, I have some questions about the number of stalls. Um, and it might be that there are 61 rentable stalls, but I have a recollection that after some design changes, we wound up with, I think, 17 stalls that are parallel to the roadway and that we excised those stalls so they were no longer part of the rentable stalls. They're just public stalls available uh, for short-term use along the only road in S block that now that occurred. Uh, and so have, have those ones been taken out of the inventory? Uh, do we have 61 less? I think it was 17, or did we start with 78 and now we have 61 rentable stalls? I, I don't need the answer today. No. <laughs> say, I but, wish I had Mr. <laughs> Jones here. He would know all that. But, sir, it, what I can say is that those seven st 17 stalls that are on street are not being rented, as in they are accessible to the public as street parking, whether they were part of the 61 or not, I can find out. Right, and, and I would appreciate that because it, it makes quite a difference to the scale of use. 15 is not very high, but it's a higher percentage of 61 minus 17. Than it is a 61. Uh, the next question I have or a series of questions relates to the other lots, the seven lots that Councilor Melman referenced. And so the leases expired, you said, in April of 2019. And so that would be the head lease between the Crown federally and the municipality. But we, we are still in possession of those. Um, is the rent for those seven lots combined with the roughly $700,000 of annual land rent that we pay? Thank you for the question, Your Worship. I um, I I want to turn the question on its head and ask you: Do do we pay land rent separately on any other leases? We, I don't think so. No. Um, so we have a number of leases uh, and a number of non-leases. So all of our public streets and lanes and and parks and the wastewater treatment plants and the water treatment plant and the cemetery are all part of um, the $700,000 annual land rent. And my question is, that, are these ones any different? Did we have, like this refers to leases and some of the other ones we don't have leases. We don't actually have a lease for our streets, I don't think. We just, we pay to use them and to maintain them and to maintain the services underneath them and all the rest of it. But I. I wonder whether these particular leases are given. Your Worship, I believe it is it is a lease. So it's a it's a land use agreement. And there is a $98 administration fee to renew it, but there are no other associated fees with the renewal of those leases. Which leads me to believe that land rent covers for those parcels. And I might be off on this one, but I believe they're they're either institutional land. So our, our parking lots are considered institutional, whether storage lots are services and storage, or whether they are institutional is a is a good question. Having that said, working on that map, I think they are services and whatever S block is zoned as. Is the zoning of those parcels, but there is no lease fee other than the admit fee to renew them. Thank you for that. Still, with respect to those expired leases for those seven lots, um, the report indicates, and I think accurately, that apart from outdoor storage, there is not much other use that could be made of those lots because we have effectively hit the development cap that was 
imposed in 2001, about two weeks before we got local government, that committee and um, Have we attempted at all to see whether there is a commercial demand for covered structures on those seven lots in block S, that is, do tradespeople, for example, um, have a need for service lots? Um, a need that would be different than simply outdoor storage. So we know that um, we've got challenges in so called Walkerville. Um, we're trying to satisfy community demand, and some of that is commercial. But do we know, have we done any investigation to see? whether there is a different need other than storage of recreational vehicles by residents for those seven lots. Deputy Mayor DeModa, through the Mayor Ireland, I, I believe that part of the conversation that an intergovernmental meeting with Parks Canada is, is how we ended up with expired leases since 2019. So that question you're asking was the very discussion at the time with Parks, which suggested that Bringing bringing the services from Walkerville into S Block is part of the community sustainability plan. Except there's no room in S Block to bring those businesses over. Those lots could be the lots, except there can't be any development because of the commercial cap. So it's sort of this political policy interagency discussion that administration has not engaged in any further. But that also like the fact that the leases have been expired since 2019 is is a bit concerning. Is something we should act on. Um, but I think you you captured the 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 issues or the debate. But their the administration has not put any effort or resources into that discussion since I want to say 2019 or 2020. Well, thank you um, for that response, and and I raise it more. Um, as an item for council then for administration. Well, I appreciate your response. It's not administration's job to sort that out, but we will, I think later this month, be having an intergovernmental meeting with Parks Canada. And I think that one of the topics that needs discussing is the commercial cap, particularly as it relates to light industrial use and what may appear to be the underuse of really limited available land in the community. So I, I thank you for raising it in the context of this report. Those are my questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councilor Hall. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Zamora. Um kind of makes me think about when we were in Banff for strap planning and visiting visiting their uh, industrial park, they had a bit of a mix of residential and commercial in there. And I wonder if that could be a conversation we also Maybe bring forward to parks again, just, just a thought. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Moore. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Nimona. I have a question that just for clarity as we're moving into budget and good bedtime reading, the 22 24 budget will be soon to get the 23 to 25 budget. But under protective and legislative services, the patron parking. Um, my notes are on it are contradictory, so I just like to get clarity on the parking revenue reflected on this page. Is it? I, it is a street parking. It's a paid parking program, and part of my note says it's a S block as well. And does it also include the parking fees for the seven other lots? In other words. The S block parking and the seven lots and the street parking should all be reflected on this one page, or if not, where does that other revenue show up? I just for clarity for moving into budget 23. Go ahead. Deputy Mayor DeModa, through to Councillor Melnick, um, your statement is accurate. So all of the parking fees, so the storage lots, S block, and paid parking, all are captured under the parking service profile or page that you're looking at in the budget. And we've been 
debating whether parking is part of bylaw or parking is separate. How do we show that revenue? But yes, your your statement is accurate. It, it is reflective of all of the parking revenue, which includes the, the two topics that are on the agenda today and pay parking. And, and I guess the last one is the, the fees that we charge for the use of parking stalls would be the fourth component that would be in this page as well. Deputy Mayor DeMoto through to Councillor Melnick, I'm thinking three streams. So the storage lots, the residential storage lots, the commercial S block parking, and paid parking. So I'm not sure if there's a fourth. The fourth would be the sidewalk seating uh, fees for the use of parking stalls. And if they're not in this page, where would they be reflected? And and again, if if um, I, it may be yourself or Miss Melanchuk, just for us moving forward, so we understand at the end of the day, when we look at the parking budget for 2022 and the actual revenues for 2022, what was all captured in that page? Councillor Melnick, I can confirm that the sidewalk seating fees are not in the parking budget they were under bylaw which is a separate page in, in the document you're looking at um and also noting that the fees for sidewalk seating the revenue generated by sidewalk seating has increased tremendously in 2022 um i i have budgeted numbers here i can't tell you exactly what the actual was for 2021 or two but we were looking at something around fifteen thousand dollars for sidewalk seating and we're at we're around more around 40 right now and we're projecting 65 for next year yes. but that is in the bylaw segment of the budget not in the parking segment thank you for the clarity appreciate it thank you councillor Malik, and um i'm not buying time for others to, to come up with more questions but uh, I do, getting back to that question, we still have a, another one, but uh, I, I appreciate you bringing that to mind. And, and again, my memory doesn't help me going back to last year's budget when we were discussing this, but I was under the impression that um, the, the street stalls, the parking stalls uh, for seating um, in the commercial use of public space, um, was based on parking revenue for those stalls. So, it, but that revenue now is being removed from the actual paid parking revenue and used in the sidewalk seating program revenue. That's just, that's just kind of where I thought they were different and separate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question, uh, Deputy Mayor DeMota. I think what happened is the fee for sidewalk seating was set for 2022, was set after the budget was passed. Yeah. And um, you're correct that it was based on the, what a stall could generate and for the season. So from May to October, if it was full every hour of the day between 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., it would yield a certain amount of dollars. And I think... 1650 uh for the season was the number that we brought to council and that represented 20 percent of what a single stall could generate and in 2022 council voted in favor of reducing that fee by 50 percent right. so in in the 800 dollars range was the fee that we actually charged which also explains our budget projections from for next year so subject to council setting the rate again if it were to go back to 1650 so the 100 percent uh recommended fee then we would see more revenue uh, coming from sidewalk seating. And certainly, um, Ms. Melichuk is in the middle of <laughs> outlining all that in the budget and what shows where and what happens and how, how it shows in our service profiles and how that's presented to council. We can certainly take your input into consideration. Yeah, and I'll definitely save that in my notes uh, for questions at that time. And to keep us from veering off into uh, sidewalk seating, I want to bring us back to S block so that we can stay on a relevant topic. Um, I went back and looked at some of the communications and, and I believe um, 
before going to PDAC prior to construction on S Block, uh, there was something brought to council at committee on July 9th of 2019. Now, because our website's changed and we don't have access to the old documents, I know that we passed um, the budget in 2018 or maybe early 2019, whenever the budget was decided for that year on S Block parking. Um, I just, um, and it's not to point fingers, like uh, this is by no means, I don't, if this isn't a mess against them scenario, I just, I wanted, to, I just want to know, uh, just like five years from now, people might want to know the decisions that were made uh, on S Block now and the recommendations that were put forward. So we don't really have access to that info anymore. And I just, it would be helpful that if we could have, um, on the end of the minute, page for 2019. Yeah, we. I understand that. I don't see the recommendation that was put forward to council on there. And um, when I do go back to the 2019 um, agendas and minutes, I I don't see the the actual recommendation there. So maybe I'm missing it. Um, I don't know, but anyway, regardless, I, I'm not going to give direction to administration. So I guess that has to come from council and until we have a little bit more time to discuss that, I don't want to drive that today. I would, it would just be helpful for me. Having said that, uh, are there any more questions from the council? Well, again, I'm not trying to be a stick in the mud right now. And if that information is made available, we can find it later. That'd be great. I'm just not having the uh, focus trying to manage the meeting and finding documents at this point. Councillor or uh, Director Mill. <laughs> Deputy Mayor DeModa, I'm not sure if that's helpful or if that's what you're looking for or not. Um, but I do have both the minutes and the agenda package from from that meeting you're referring to. And I think it, that was part of the question you raised earlier. Um, so the potential uses for S block. So I have a list here and that was from Mr. Fritton at the time of what could it be used for? And then council selected from that list to say uh, designated parking for community members was the outcome. But certainly um, that was also before we started doing paid parking. So those decisions made in 2019, 2020 did not uh, we're not reflective of our experience with paid parking in the community at large, right? Which might change which direction council might decide to go in. But um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But I, we have that information and we can forward it if that's helpful for your thought process. It's good. If, if it's there and it's available, I'll, I'll find it. That's, uh, I appreciate that. And again, um, just the foresight. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Council Waxer. I'm very sorry. You know what? I apologize for uh, not acknowledging that you were zooming in from PEI again, and we really appreciate that. Thank you for your presence here today, and I'm uh, sorry I missed your hand in there. Thank you, uh, Emily, for that. Thank you. Uh, through uh, you, Deputy Mayor DeModen, to administration. Uh, my question is, if you are parked in one of the uh, fenced lots, uh, do you have year round uh, ability to park year round uh, is the first part of my question. <laughs> or only for the winter months. Thank you for the question, Councillor Waxer. You can park there year round. Having that said, access in the winter might be a different story. So whether we plow those lots and whether you're able to uh, pull your property in and out of the lot. So I'm thinking a, a large recreational trailer, for example. Um, that's something I would have to clarify, but it, the units are there year round. And my second question was that, would we anticipate uh, 
a, a similar fee structure for behind the fences in the unpaved lots as we would uh, for RVs as we would in the um, in the S block. Deputy Mayor Demota, through Councillor Waxer, that is part of the research that the administration would undertake. Shall council direct us to look at a proposal for winter use of the S block parking lot? Um, as I outlined earlier, the service is a bit different. So a paved parking lot versus the, the current condition of the storage lots. And uh, as you mentioned, whether they're fenced or not and and what other comparable services um, are, what kind of fees are associated with them in other communities is something we would look at them and certainly looking at um, if Jasperites were to use a different location in, in Belmont or Hinton, for example, how do we compare? And, and what kind of fee should be associated um, would be part of the upcoming work if we get a council direction to go that way. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Good questions. So there are, are there any other ones that haven't been asked? Council Nomic. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor DeMoto. I think um, we've had a good discussion on um, what's in front of us, and I'm uh, prepared to make a motion um, along the lines of the recommendations from administration to move this along. Um, and so if I might make that motion, that committee direct administration to develop a residential winter parking program for vacant stalls in the S block parking lot and report back at an upcoming committee of the whole, and that committee direct administration to propose a fee increase to the storage lot by law number 208 and report back to the upcoming committee of the whole meeting. I think that'll give administration the opportunity to come back with perhaps some numbers for us to look at, and then we can decide the, where those lots will uh, will play in the 2023-2024 budget. Thank you for that motion. Is there any debate? Councilor Hall? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I do support this motion. Um, the second part about increasing these, the storage lots, just quick math, it's just under $27 a month, I, I think is quite low <laughs> compared to, and I, and I also wonder how long that's been the rate, and maybe it is time to increase it, but I do support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Hall, Your Worship. I thank um, Councillor Melnick for taking the ball. Um, I was about to, to propose a slightly different motion. And I'm not sure that I can offer this as a friendly amendment. Potentially I can, it changes the motion somewhat. I would have recommended that committee direct administration to develop not a residential winter parking program, but a revised parking program. I think winter residential for residential winters is, is too restrictive. There might be other options. So simply a revised parking program for stalls that would strike vacant. We can't have a program for occupied stalls and for vacant stalls. That doesn't sit with me. Um, so I would I would make those changes and if that can be considered by the deputy mayor as a friendly amendment that I gave it to. Councillor Melnick, but I would suggest a wording change for the first recommendation that committee direct administration to develop a revised parking program for stalls in the S block parking lot and report back at an upcoming committee of the whole meeting and the second vote as it was proposed by Councillor Melnick. Well, who am I to challenge that? Um, yeah, I, I would allow that if Councillor Bellick would be open to. I am good with the changes to the to the recommendations for administration, and I accept the friendly amendment. Okay. Does administration have that motion captured and that was delivered? Okay, we have two thumbs up, maybe four. So, uh, okay, if everyone understands the motion, I'll. Call it all in favor. 
That's carrying all five of us. Thank you, Councilor Waxer. All right, appreciate that. Mr. Mayor, your worship. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. In order, before we leave the topic entirely, um, I have an additional motion that Committee of the Whole recommend that Council add the topic of the commercial cap to our next intergovernmental forum of Parks Canada. Okay. Right. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. Is there any debate? Any discussion? Comments? Great, right, I'll call it. All in favor? That's Karen. All right. We got a nod from Emma that that's captured. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. That brings us to um, agenda item. 7.2 and before we get that there might be a little bit of a lengthy conversation as well so i'm all oh, no I'm, I'm i'm gonna yeah it's gonna be a task so i'm gonna call a brief break um it is now uh 10 51 if we can get back here for 11 o'clock to start appreciate that thank you hey we made it back within the minute of 11 o'clock so i'd like to Call us back to order. Thank you very much, everyone, for your patience and uh, letting us have that break. Um, now that we've finished our conversation on uh, 7.1 S block parking, we're moving to 7.2 outdoor recreation facilities policy. Director Reed, would you like to start? Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor uh, Demota and Tim Council. So the item before you is the outdoor recreation facility policy, and the recommendation is that county that committee <laughs> recommend <laughs> council rescind policy D14 and municipal field use policy and D15 outdoor skating surface policy and adopt the draft outdoor recreation facility policy. The options, of course, council can uh, recommend our committee can recommend the council rescind the policies with uh, amendments. Or committee can direct administration to update the draft policy with changes suggested today and return to a future committee of the whole meeting with an amended draft policy. So, uh, back in August, a committee directed administration to prepare and present at a future committee meeting a draft policy and administrative procedure regarding recreational use of outdoor municipal facilities. Administration took this direction of and has developed a draft policy which would apply to all outdoor facilities on municipal land. And this would be both temporary and permanent uh, or fixed uh, uh, facilities to cover our current and future needs. Administration's understanding of council's goal was to expand and clarify the previous policies, which uh, were limited to temporary ice services and just park spaces. I'm sorry we missed that last clarification. This open-ended policy would encompass municipally owned and controlled parks and green spaces, sports fields, ice surfaces, playgrounds, sledding hills, bike and skate parks, court courts, Etc. Um, the municipality recognizes that outdoor recreation plays an important role in building a well connected, engaged, and healthy community. And by ensuring the safety of all our outdoor facilities, the municipality will continue to support residents and visitors in safely participating in outdoor recreational pursuits while limiting liability to the municipality. Uh, the re relevant legislation, this policy would replace policy D014 and policy D015. And the strategic relevance, you can see that uh, it covers the gamut of community health. So promoting and enhancing recreational cultural opportunities slash spaces, enable and facilitate events that provide opportunities to increase community connection, leverage and create opportunities for greater inclusion, and recognize the fundamental importance of our tourism economy. Uh, this policy would not need any additional budgetary support. The attachments, of course, the draft outdoor recreational facilities policy, as well as links to the two previous policies that we would look to read in here. And um, without reciting the policy, it simply says that we will maintain our um, our outdoor recreation opportunities uh, safely and affordably through the development and maintenance of permanent and or temporary outdoor facilities on municipal property. And then under the definition there, 
you'll note that we listed everything we know of today, but we did allow for the future with that little addition of the et cetera. Um, as we change as a municipality, this policy would not have to change. Simply, we would add to our administrative procedures. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Much appreciated. Uh, I really appreciate the, the thought behind this and the time that's put in. Uh, Councillor Hall has some comments. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I love this policy because these are rec areas within the town site, accessible for all. Lots of our members of the community don't own vehicles and creating and maintaining these spaces, I think is really important. Um, in the actual policy, I'm not really sure about the word affordable because it makes it seem, it kind of makes it seem like we know how much money people have. And I wonder if accessible would replace that word and still make sense. Um, if, if I may, uh, Deputy Mayor DeMoto to the Council Hall and all councils, that's a, a great addition and, and we could simply make that amendment today if that was the only amendment and bring that back to Council with that change. Well, our, I will just jump in to say that Accessibility is actually our goal. The word affordable is part of accessibility, um, but only one aspect of it. And so accessible is a much better word. I appreciate that change. I appreciate that thought behind that. Within that context, can accessibility mean different things though? So uh, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor DeMora. Uh, absolutely, it can. And so accessibility, um, using our uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion policy that we have, accessibility and, and inclusivity. Um, so something like um, the, the outdoor skating opportunities, uh, we would work hard to make those as accessible to all uh, residents and visitors. And so in this case, accessible would include, in this case, free, and it would also include, um, you know, level ground to approach the service. Um, so, so yes, accessible has a more uh, in-depth meaning, and, and yes, we would apply that across the spectrum. Yeah, just, you know, I, I'm, more, I'm concerned in my mind about minimizing, you know, uh, a certain demographic. So if that is, to be all inclusive, then that's kind of if that's acceptable. I, I don't know because things change so much on you know social more kind of understandings. Councillor Holly wanted to make a comment. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, the only I, I guess the, because what's affordable to one family might not be affordable to another family. So you know the hockey program or skiing or things out of town are affordable to lots of people, but. Uh, a skating service is affordable to that same person, but more affordable to someone else. I just don't want to assume how much money our residents have and what is affordable to them and what's not affordable for the next family. Thank you for that. Councillor Mellon, did you uh, worship? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Tomorrow, I appreciate the discussion we just had. It was my note as well, and I, I note that of the two policies that we are recommended to revoke, one uses portability and the other uses accessibility, and I prefer accessibility as well. My only concern is that, and I, I appreciate that once council passes a motion to adopt the policy, the procedures are in the hands of administration. However, with a, a brand new policy, it would be nice to see the starting point. And I would be more comfortable if I saw the standards first before the policy. So I don't know when the standards will be developed. And I appreciate that the standards aren't subject to further council review. Nevertheless, um, overreaching as I may be, I would kind of like to see where we're going before I go in favor of going. There. So, can you tell me anything about the standards that are being developed or 
will become part of the procedures with the bylaw. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor, for the moment to the worship and all temple. So absolutely, um, I think the simplest simplest way to understand is that um, the existing procedure you would see um, for the um, D D14 or the, the park space is a fairly robust document. Um, our procedure involves, so for example, one of the reasons why we, we, you know, we keep that on the administrative side is that so a skating rink uh, may require daily inspection, a playground may require bi-weekly inspection, and we may up or, or maybe increase or decrease that based on the usage, based on the time of year. Um, and so what we have is um, a very straightforward program where the administration of, of all of this, the, the procedure side says each amenity gets its own um, specific procedure, uh, based, uh, certainly based on the minimum regulations, legislation that may apply to each amenity, uh, but also based on our experience, we typically up that, um, for example, the, the skating surface or some of our playgrounds, um, depending on the weather, our fields may get inspected twice a day, um, depending on what tournament might be in. So, so we have each amenity gets its own uh, checklist that is, you know, based again on legislation, regulation, and industry standard, and then it gets uh, scheduled again based on those three requirements. And so uh, we could certainly uh, expose council to that. Um, what we, we uh, CAO Given and I discussed that today, uh, whether or not to bring that today. Um, making sure that we're on the right track with what council's wishes were. And so we did not bring the procedures as you uh, indicated, they are administrative. And so we felt we wanted to keep you uh, on the governance side and give you that clarity while you make this level of decision. But um, we can certainly uh, send that around to council as a, as a sort of a backup document with, with our questions. If I may. Oh yeah, please do. And I appreciate that. Um, yes, um, I and the rest of us have a duty to stay in our lane, and that, that's fair. Um, what I'm mostly interested in, I think, is is the wording of Article Three of the proposed policy, and it refers to uh, maintaining facilities in a reasonably safe condition. But it has no wording about being reasonably accessible. So if we change the word to accessible, that means people can use it. But what we've had in the past, people complaining about closures. But closures are there for a purpose. They're there typically for asset management. So if the field is too wet, sorry, you can't use it. But then residents say, wait, your policy says it has to be accessible. So I would prefer. If I don't see the wording, a change to the wording of the standard section in the policy to say maintain in a reasonably safe condition and reason with reasonable accessibility to give you more room to maneuver in your lane. Uh, Deputy Mayor, devote it through to uh, your worship. Uh, that's a, another great addition. I certainly don't mind that extra clarity. Um, with our parks and sports field, uh, the existing policy and procedure that we've had for quite some number of years, um, we have uh, the policy and the procedure do, in fact, give that clarity. I think what you're asking for. But the, but the sentence that you have suggested, and so, so again, I, I would gladly take that as what you would term a friendly amendment. We could add that sentence in for when we bring it back to council. Um, I have pulled up the the procedure for the for this policy, and so um, just just to I guess set your mind at ease for your for your vision. Um, so, X, section one of the policy is regular inspection. And it, it is again the, the items that I listed, right? Regulation, 
uh, live, or, um, legislation and industry best practices and our own knowledge of our local area. Um, and then uh, section two is if there are deficiencies in the inspection, it describes what we would do. So in a major case, we would note the deficiency, close the facility, alert the director. Uh, and for minor issues, we would close the facility temporarily, solve the problem as quickly as possible and reopen. So right in the policy, it clearly uh, drives us to be open more than, than uh, closed, so to speak. Um, and then uh, section three simply says that we will have prominent signage uh, warning people of the status uh, when we do have a closure. So it is like I've, I've compressed it just to, to the bullet points of the headings, but it is exactly what you're uh, asking for to see. Um, does that help? Did we get to that? I think we're moving in the same direction. Um, and I, I appreciate that the reason we want to rescind um, the existing policy or policies, and that includes C014, which is the municipal fuel use policy. That's only four years old. And a lot of consideration was given to those words. And so, yes, I agree, we send it to combine. But if you read that policy and the purpose, I think it is quite reflective of the intent. More so, I think, than the policy that's presented to us. So, um, more of those words, um, I think, would be beneficial. So, there we indicate that we're striving to provide in, in sports fields. We can change that wording outdoor recreational facilities in a safe condition. I, we should be compliant with relevant league and sports standards. If we're going to provide the opportunity, it should comply. Um, Balancing accessible community and public use and enjoyment with field management best practices. That's a good policy, I think. And, and so for the new policy, I would be more comfortable to add those words. And then I know that we've got the freedom to manage the fields according to best practice um, and safety considerations. And the purpose part of the field use policy also is good. If it wasn't for the fact that we've got two policies i'm not sure that we have to change this the existing one so i'm just advocating in favor of the wording that i think better expresses the intent and gives administration a freer hand to to apply best management practices to all of our facilities at all times Um, your work, our deputy mayor, the one through your worship. That that's great, uh, great feedback, and and we will make that uh, change. Uh, and and if council is, is understanding my level of understanding, we can do that for uh, for, for council meeting, or we can bring it back to another committee as you may see fit. But but your points are well heard. There's absolutely no reason why we can add a few more uh, bits of wording in without sounding defensive. Um, your point about <laughs> giving us capacity to act and, and almost the support of the policy more clearly, that's what I'm hearing. We, we certainly on our side saw it almost the other way, where um, what we are doing in the procedure is described uh, clearly. And the policy was meant to be that high level governance. But, but all of this wording is entirely workable, and we will uh, incorporate it uh, either for council next week or for the committee call great um i'm not sure if it's worth it not to take any steam away from anyone but uh so it doesn't appear that the mayor is directing the administration that i do see a friendly nod from everybody that they understood and support the mayor Arnold's comments and i do too that's okay. All right. I appreciate that because words matter for me as much as I used to dislike the term closed. I don't know to what use it would go in here. Uh, you know, when, when it comes to marketing Jasper on the grand scheme of things, if something does get temporarily uh, shut down for a while, I, I like the term uh, temporary restricted use as opposed to closed, because you don't want that message to stay out there. It's all oh, the arena's closed, you know, or Jasper's not open. So, 
that's just uh, my angle on things. Because we're just matter. Councillor Waxer. Uh, by the way, I, I, do you hear, for the other viewers out there, Councillor Waxer, do you hear um, Director Reed quite good? Okay, good. It's quite a distance. Okay, it is quite a distance. Uh, I, my only question is, uh, having spent considerable time talking about uh, sledding at Snape's Hill, I wondered about the definition of facilities and if they're needed to be, because um, I think youth in particular may be uh, creative in creating uh, uh, new facilities of their own in, in when we're talking about out, outdoors. And I just wanted to be sure that um, at, at this point we talked about Snape Hill and it's not going to be considered a municipal facility, but uh, there's it's still possible that people will use it or, um, and if we, even if we put a sign up there, there may be other areas. I just wondered um, if we needed any work on the uh, word facilities. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Zimota, through the Council of Waxer. Um, so we specifically said on that a facility must be on municipally owned land and operated by the municipality of Jasper. So uh, while there are many places that various recreational activities could occur, uh, we would, you know, should there be a problem, a safety issue, then we will take that as a safety issue. We wouldn't really have anything to do with this policy. This policy is only for designated uh, uh, facilities that we create and or operate. So it, it must be uh, a designated and, and again, inspected, safely created and built and maintained space. So as far as Snake Hill goes, should there be um, uh, what we might call uh, renegade or, or rogue tobogganing occurring on Snake Hill, the safety concerns would be brought to the municipality and the municipality would work to solve the safety concerns, but that facility would not be a facility and would not be part of this policy. We, we, that's the clarity we put in that definition specifically for that. Um, so until we designate Snake Hill as Boggin Hill or Sledding Hill, it is not um, and does not fall under this policy. Safety concerns in the general municipality uh, get addressed as safety concerns. Does that answer your question, Captain? Absolutely, that's the reassurance I wanted. Thank you. Non-sanctioned use of sledding in the community. Are there any other questions, comments, or considerations? Mayor Island. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Dupont. If there are not, see no other hands. Um, I will make a motion that committee recommend council rescind policy B014 municipal field use policy and policy B015 outdoor skating surface policy and adopt the draft outdoor recreation facilities policy with amendments as discussed at the committee of the whole on October 11, 2022. All right. Very good. Are there? I think um, I don't know if my battery's dying here or not. I don't feel like I've been talking a lot. Um, it keeps shutting up. <laughs> Does anyone have anything to debate, discuss, or make comments on? All right. I'll call the motion. Then. All in favor? Not opposed. That's carried. All right, so maybe this probably would have been a better place to take a break before we go into utilities, but I wanted us to get on a roll. So here we are going to agenda item 7.3, utility rate model outcomes review. Ms. Nadone, Director Nadone, would you like to lead the discussion on this, please? 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor DeMota. I can certainly introduce the topic okay. and to say that uh, this came to the September 27th Committee of the Whole Meeting and uh, the direction that was provided by Council at the time is reflected under the background in the report. And uh, Ms. Malinchak has been doing some more work on this item and she will be leading you through it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you bear with me for two seconds, my um, computer crashed, of course. <laughs> two seconds, thank you. It's starting off. I saw that you were busy there and um, Christine was looking at me, so that's why I went to her first and if need be, we could take a couple of minutes here. Well, I had a dad joke while I was over the weekend from Thanksgiving uh, since I started that. Uh, someone asked me, how do farmers listen to rap music? They like to turn up the beats. Anyway, it's a little bit of a, I don't even have kids, but you know, I've got a lot of uh, young friends that uh, are uh, my friends' kids and and uh nieces and nephews <laughs> yeah that was just bailed out <laughs> she was laughing too hard anyway it's it's harvest times it was appropriate for thanksgiving I like that. okay uh ms malinchak thank you for the time and uh <laughs> the joke <laughs> in the meantime um i don't know why it seems i always crash right before i have to go on um, but yes, so we're bringing back the utility rate model um, outcome review uh, as presented at the 27th of September meeting. Two motions were made, and uh, one of the motions being that um, it, uh, it was directed to administration to present alternative alternatives to, uh, to the calculations charge for church properties within the, East, uh, the CCC model um, and to achieve greater equity. Um, therefore, just to highlight a few extra things within the, the report, um, there was a typo that was alluded to um, by Councillor Melnick, and it has been changed and updated within the report. So, yes, after 66% of the year, 75% um, of the forecasted budget revenue has been brought in by the CCC model. Um, so this was anticipated just because of the additional use during uh, summer months with usage from the additional tourism as well as um, from people watering their gardens and their lawns and whatnot. So um, at the 33% and the 50%, the model was actually bang on 33% and 50% of the projected bu budget. So this this was completely um, projected. Another thing that was brought up by Councillor Wall was a question about the changes in the capital and connection revenue and why they had changed. And my answer was um, about bringing on additional um, properties. Now, um, that then you've seen a bigger change, a lot bigger in May and June. And uh, that was, there was supposed to be an adjustment made and it actually hadn't happened at that point, but it's happened now. Um, but there still is a bigger jump there. And what it is, is bringing on some properties that are on the um, south side of the from the municipality. So um, bringing on those meters because they they don't operate in the winter. So that's what you've seen the increase. And then um, they'll likely go down again when they go off season. Um, and... To talk about the equity that was brought up by um, uh, His Worship, 
I did um, analysis of 2021 versus 2022. And um, in 2021, if you notice on, uh, I think it's page 25 of the, the agenda, there's some charts that represent the numbers that I'm going to speak to here. In 2021, the previous model, residents, uh, property, residential properties accounted for approximately 41% of the consumption, while they only contributed 30% of the fees. Um, so this indicates that the residential properties were being, were under contributing. In 2022, with a new model, resident users, again, are responsible for about the same amount of usage, so 38%. But now they are contributing about 35% of um, the levies. So it's gone up. It's not exact, but um, it's a lot closer than it was. So this has increased the level of equity that we've seen from residential to and commercial properties, the difference between them. And then we also spoke about um, church properties at the last meeting. And I, we just wanted to clarify that it, it is just to one property that this um, oddity occur occurred and it kind of got reflected. Um, we did some additional work to look into why this property might um, be higher than others. Now, this church has two meters. All the other ones have one meter only. Um, these meters are five eighths of an inch as well as two inches. Um, this church has a residence on the property as well as a rentable space, which is quite large. And the consumption is much, much greater than the other five churches being, um, they were using 100 and, 117 cubic meters in July and August versus to all others combined using 123 cubic meters. So. They ranged, all of the other churches ranged from eight to 56 cubic meters in their uses during those two months. So um, that's something to note as well. So as um, as we're speaking about this, it re does reflect that the model is being correctly applied to the property. Um, administration would recommend against making uh, special considerations um, as um, it would likely lead to other properties or property types requesting special treatments or exemptions as well. Um, overall, the CCC model has been working correctly um, and on par with its projections and uh, generating the required revenue that was forecasted. And that is it for the um, report. And uh, we can definitely bring more reports down um, in the future as to the outcomes with the change of these uh, seasons as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Councillors. Councillor Helmick. Thank you for the report. Appreciate that, Ms. Melanchuk. Um, I want to refer to page 29 and specifically to the 1.5 inch category in both connection and capital seems to only capture a small amount of, of revenues there. And I'm wondering um, if we might be able to make a move to that middle category to go to be 1.5 to 2, which would then take some users from the above 1.5 and put them into the 1.5 to 2 category, and then you would have 2 and above, or above 2 inches as a, as a supply of a line. And the, re the reason I mention that is in the way this is being presented, I can't see if the capital component is, are we overcharging the capital according to budget or undercharging? Um, because I, I sense that we're going to be over budget and it'll probably be by consumption uh, unless we maybe overcharge some users based on their pipe size. And, and I see us having an opportunity to do the exercise of seeing how that would affect some users. 
Um, currently, we're at two point nine million dollars of water sewer combined revenue, and um, I just did a very simple extrapolation by taking the January, February, and March, April bills and pretended those to be the last two quarters. And I show that we'll be up to, we could be a quarter million dollars over budget by adding those two billing periods to the existing four, which might mean we may be overcharging in that capital category. It, it would be worth the exercise to make sure that that's not the case. So I think that was part of the biggest discussion about um, why bills went up so much for some users. Um, I don't know if that exercise has been done, but um, uh, the other reason we could end up being over that much is people are just using that much more water. And, you know, our, our fees are, are, are such that if you use more, you're going to pay more. I appreciate your math, and you know what I was—I was trying to figure out myself on you know where we're at and the the seventy-five versus thirty-three ratio. <laughs> and in my mind, I think about springtime, and even though we have years will you know in the, in the, in in the early year, um, people are also when the snow's melting, watering things and flowers and grass and, <laughs> and all sorts of stuff, including you know our own grounds. But uh, so. At the risk of changing things up, like we did with parking, and, and it might be worth our while to see this whole thing through and see where we're at the end. Um, my question, I guess, through to administration, would it be an extremely arduous task that if we did overcharge, that we could offer some rebates or some uh, relief for people, or uh, you know, that were affected in those categories. I like where Councilor Melnick's going. I uh, guess I I agree. This uh, we can look at the the, um, the two inch greater than two inch prospect and see. Um, however, I do also want to see how it will um, pan out for the year and if our calculations will work out appropriately. <coughs> Um, now, I do see it um, being high. There will be some come offline, not many, but there will be some. Um, and yes, being being that said, um, the next uh, conversation to have is reserves on the um, on the policy. So there there are alternatives as to what can be done with the the amount of money if it does. Oh, does if it does end up at calculating or retrieving more money than we had projected, it could potentially offset um, fees for the next year. Um, it could. Um, it, it's it's entirely council's decision. Um, if we have, um, uh, uh, there could be a reserve set up as a contingency for other things. Um, but there there is that option to then take that money set it aside for future. Um, and it can be applied towards the next year for sure. Um, so those discussions would then, if, if um, the policy um, moves forward and has changed, then my intention is then to bring back every year before going into um, year end about what we can do with any kind of surpluses and, and um, in looking at the reserve policy going forward. But yes, we would definitely be uh, not just applying it to an overall surplus, we can look at other alternatives. Yeah, if, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for that. And, and I just want to make it clear that my estimate is is strictly an estimate using existing numbers. There's no real basis for it. I don't know what consumption is going to be like. I'm making some huge assumptions there. So I don't want the public to all of a sudden think, Wow, they've overcharged and there's a quarter million dollars someplace. It could be that there are, we're only 50,000 or whatever over and, and that's really a small insignificant amount. But I'm just speculating that, that we may have an opportunity to apply if we have overcharged, um, that to either capital reserves or, or, um, to prevent a greater increase in the following budget year. 
Yeah, and I just, too, I, I want to be clear. I'm glad you said that. Um, you know, I didn't, I hope it didn't come across about being flippant because, um, to, you know, uh, compare this to paid parking because I know it has a greater impact on our residents and, and, um, as we've seen, take the, the burden, um, on much of this. So, um, I, I was just saying in comparison, even though like this isn't a pilot project, but seeing as if this will be our first year, uh, we are reviewing it, uh, like we said we would. And I think it would be prudent to see how the metrics work with the system and where we are uh, come, you know, December 31st. And once we get there, I mean, that will give us a really good idea and maybe think about what Councillor Melnick is proposing or, or maybe some other tweaks to make this as good as it can for Jasper because I, I like the way it's going and um, you know, I know it's not well received because it's new and anything you do, it's it's going to come back with a little bit of pushback and hopefully we can take some of the the, the pushback and, and look at what our capital costs are and, and make things work as best as it can for the community. Councilor Holly, you had your hand up. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I just have a couple questions. The church in question, the residence on that property is included in that bill? Yes, correct. Okay. And then also... We last last week we learned that like what I voted for was an average of between forty and fifty dollars a month increase for the resident, which I thought was very fair, and we're kind of right on that mark. We still get the emails every now and then. I'm sure administration still get the email of the resident who is experiencing some unusually high bill. How are you guys dealing with that? And are you the right place for us to direct residents who still have those concerns that are asking us, you know, on the street or in our inbox? Thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, sorry, Deputy Mayor, through to Councillor Wall. Um, yes, of course, we can always answer questions and look into um, oddities. Um, there might even be something that was off for that month and or two months, and we we want to analyze that as well. You know, if there's leaks that occurred or whatnot. So yes, definitely tell anybody to contact the office, and uh, we can look into the situation if it's different from. The um, especially the last two um, months billing. Um, and sorry, I believe there was another part to that question. No, that is everything. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Um, may I defer to Council Waxer first and then your next is your name? Uh, I just wanted to express appreciation for the clarity on the church property. Um, uh, I was left feeling a little bit uncomfortable last week, but um, that the explanation is is clear and uh, leaves me comfortable with that uh, going forward. Thank you, Councilor Waxer, uh, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Kimoda. I am more concerned and suspect of my own map than Councillor Melnick <laughs> is. Nevertheless, I, I did a bunch of it. I will try and start this out. So it, <clears throat> we have had concerns raised by both um, the commercial sector and the residential sector with respect to increased costs. Um, and in part, it's it's all blamed on the model, but it seems to me that um, two thirds of the way through the year, um, we have collected, like you said, seventy five percent of the anticipated revenue, and it appears to me that the extra revenue that we have collected so far is about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars over the last year which means that we're going to collect a million dollars more this year than last year. Is that is that anywhere close to accurate? And I, I say that just looking at, at the numbers last year, if the total combined, well, it's, I guess it's closer to 800,000. It goes from 2.1 to 2.9, is that? That's where we're, how? 
That's the 750,000 that we've collected so far. Deputy Mayor, through to you, Worship. Um, so there is also, if you're comparing to 2021, um, there was an increase in the the um, budget alone of $872,000. In the water and sanitary um, levy itself, it increased from it increased 572,000. So um, yes, it has increased. You'll see those those fluctuations, but the levies themselves did increase and it was mainly due to the additional amounts being con contributed to the reserves for the infrastructure, um, being that we need to focus a little bit more attention on our asset management of those, of those systems. Um, this, I must say, is a very complex uh, calculation that took us many, many tries to get. And I feel very confident so far in what I've seen, being that at 33% of the year, at 50% of the year, they were completely bang on. The only reason we were over was because of consumption in the, in the next billing period. So... And you can definitely be certain that the, that consumption will go down compared for the next few months, especially in November when we get really slow. Um, I can't say for sure that it's going to be a perfect model. I do think that it, there could be room for improvement, um, but I do feel that we need to see how it, it will work out, and we can um, we can work with things in the future if if that should be the case. But at the moment, I I'm very, very certain in how things have been working out. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, appreciate that level of confidence. Uh, as you know, my concern is one of equity. So when I try and compare these numbers, if I use the 2021 numbers, um, it indicates that residential consumption was 41% and residential contribution was 30%. And the numbers have changed, right? So total combined revenue in 2021 was 2.176 million. Um, for 2022, it was 2.9. If I took 30%, so last year's contribution by residents and applied it to this year's number, 30% um, of that 2.9 would be $828,000. It's gone up like that. It's a $200,000 increase, which is about 25% of what residents had been paying. So they got a 25% increase. Whereas in my calculations, the commercial sector got about an 8% increase. So is that the equity that we intended? It's only a question. I, it's a question more for council than for anybody else, but I, as I say, my math is suspect, but that's the way I did it. Um, and then the, qu the second question is the, the indication is that because residents were consuming 41% and this year it's 38% of volume, that should be reflected in their contribution. However, did we not apply a tiered rate? And doesn't the tiered rate suggest that volume of consumption is not the factor that is most important. If if consumption alone was the guiding principle, then we wouldn't have been encouraged, it seems to me, to apply a tiered rate. And those who are playing paying the tiered rate are complaining because they say a, a unit is a unit is a unit. It doesn't cost more just because I take more units. They may have a point, um, but we did apply a tiered rate on the basis, I thought, that those heavy users put more strain on the system. Mm -hmm. And so if the residents are not using 
the volume overall, why would we have a tiered rate and why would we use consumption as the basis to decide whether or not we had achieved equity in the system? And it's not just equity between user groups, commercial and residential. It seems to me there's still an outstanding question of equity within user groups. So we continue to have the issue that was brought forward early when we adopted the, the model of differential treatment between commercial users, roughly of the same category, but with different size pipes. And it may still be defensible, but I think we have to show why it is defensible. And I still struggle on the residential side with equity among residential users. users. So I don't know what size of the line goes into an apartment building with 60 <laughs> units. Um, but are they paying proportionately anything close to what a residential standalone property is paying? I, I have just lost how we calculate that degree of equity within the system. So I, and I, I won't go back to, to refight that battle, but I, I had suggested there might be other ways to apportion the capital um, and connection fee based on say number of outlets you have in your property or number of bathrooms or something that seemed far too complex and I accept that. But I would still like some measure of equity of, among categories rather than just between categories. And uh, it's a challenge I, I think for all of us, I don't throw this all on administration, but I am still working to say that we have achieved equity, but I will say that the fact that we're collecting a whole lot more money um, to keep the system viable and sustainable probably makes the greatest difference. We are charging more because we recognize that we need more to make the system sustainable. And more is more, no matter what side of the equation you're on. It, it, it's, it's not pleasant to have an increased bill, but we can explain why. But I still look for, for a defense of, of equity um, in what we have done. And given all of that, um, <coughs> and I won't make the motion yet, but I throw it out for council consideration. This has been a uniquely difficult experience for successive councils. And I know that in, how long ago was it? In preparation for the 2020 budget, I think we, 2021 budget, we tried to pass uh, a bylaw on December 15th of 2020. That was previous council and we delayed it all because we couldn't sort out this particular bylaw and last council struggled to the end of its term to come to grips with this. Current council accepted um, the benefit of all the work that administration had done previously and in February of this year adopted a model that even then with this review prominent in mind to go back after four billing cycles. And it continues um, to be monumentally difficult. <clears throat> so simply having raised the revenue that we projected, um, that's good, but it doesn't mean that we've done it in an equitable way. And so at the end of all of this, I, I'm inclined to suggest that this council engage in a workshop and see whether we can um, with only one matter on the agenda, that being this bylaw, see whether we can come to grips with the equity question. And Councilor Melnick might be right. Maybe we could do greater equity if we reconfigured the pipe size. Maybe we should look again at tiered rates. I'm not sure it's, it's a huge challenge, but it, it continues to leave me uncomfortable because it continues to be really difficult to explain 
to taxpayers, whether they're residential taxpayers or uh, non-residential taxpayers. Good points, Your Worship. Um, and I do, I do remember uh, some of the debate around the tiers, and someone had commented the fact that, well, maybe if uh, customers consume more, um, they should get uh, less of a rate with the more that they consume. But I think we're trying to con we were trying to promote conservation, and that would be um, the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. So um, that was quite a difficult conversation to have, and I think that tiered model was basically to support that. Right? I'm correct. Now, if I can go back to, to your comments, Your Worship, on um, equity, I'm just trying to wrap around my, my head around, let's say I have a residence, um, just say three bedroom house next to a 20 room apartment. We both only have one connection and it's the same size connection. Um, do our fees right now, are, are those two things the same, the, the capital and the connection fees for those two types of scenarios? Is that what the mayor is trying to iron out as far as equity goes in those things? Uh, Deputy Mayor, um, so it does depend on the size and generally the sizing is higher if you have an apartment building versus a house. The house is, the, is usually a five-eighths versus an apartment building and it has to service. Um, I think that a lot of useful or thoughts have been put into this and I, I too have written down some stuff um, and some more, you know, work to be done on analyzing a bit more on on for instance, that scenario of a house versus an apartment building and how many people are using that service and, and what is being paid. Um, so uh, yes, they would pay the same connection and capital fee if they were the same, but they were not, um, they will not be the same for, for that size of property. They will be more um, for a larger building because they need a larger meter. So. But yes, definitely some uh, thoughts have come up on how we can analyze further on the equity portion of within um, categories, not against another category. So yes, I, I, I see that, that that being a valid study. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, I was trying to dumb it down for myself, but for other people that might be, you know, caught up in the in the quagmire of this and. Um, you know, and I appreciate that. And eventually this might have to be, as we grow, might have to get onto into drilling down into individual situations when it comes down to what size of apartments or whatever it is, because maybe someone's got uh you know six bedroom house and and, and comparing that to a two bedroom bungalow or whatever it is. I mean, I'm just using those as examples. So I mean, eventually those things will We'll start to correct the system a little better if the desire is there to go that deep. And if need be, then you know that's what we have to do to make it equitable. But um, again, I'd, I'd like to see this thing go out, and, and as much as that might pain uh, some people to hear, um, that might be the best process. Until we see the end result, we, we can't make better decisions for the future. Councillor Mellon, Councillor Hall, Your Worship, you still uh, putting together a motion to someone? I I am prepared to make a motion. Okay. Um, first, that committee receive the report for information. And that committee direct administration to organize and prepare for a workshop for council and key staff for further discussion of the utility rate bylaw. Speaking to that motion, I heard from our director of 
finance and administration that I think that based on today's discussion, there are some further <clears throat> details that she could try and flesh out and comparisons to be made within categories in particular. And so with that degree of preparation could be done in advance and come to a workshop. There still might be more that comes out of the workshop, but I think that in speaking to the motion, the nature of the decision we are asked to make is of such significance to the community that it warrants this particular council engaging in a way that it has yet to have had the opportunity to do. So I'm proposing a workshop whenever um, it becomes <clears throat> convenient, given that we're going into budget as well. But of course, this impacts budget, but it's status quo until we change it. I feel that's a prudent approach. Does anyone have any comments or thoughts to debate? So we want to understand the motion. Administration, we capture that. All right, I'll call it a question. All in favor? That opposed? That's carried. Thank you again, Councilor Waxer. All right. Uh, okay. So we've gone for another hour here. Um, as the days get longer, <laughs> as the day gets longer, the days are getting shorter as far as daylight goes. Um, we're into the noon hour of the meeting. We still have a few agenda items to go. I think that we could probably finish them off. Um, before we go for lunch, a reserve policy, and then I'm not sure if we'll get to 7.5 today. We might have to return to that when Councillor Wilson's available. So, um, if everyone's okay, I would like to take a quick break for five minutes and then come back and finish off the agenda. Then we not. Okay, let's do this quickly. Okay, five minutes. Five minutes. Can I pause the time? It is now 12. Um, I'd like to bring us back to Committee of the Whole. We are now on agenda item 7.4, reserve policy. Can we go directly to you, Ms. Malinchak? Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so today, administration is bringing forward a recommendation to, count to committee um to receive the draft reserve policy b112 as presented and direct administration to return to a future committee with a full of the whole with um schedule a reserve descriptions um and there are all there are always alternatives um that committee could recommend council approve the reserve policy with the following amend amendments um and that committee direct administration to re revise the reserve policy uh, based on the discussions that were had held today. Um, so just to give a little bit more background um, for those that may have not had a chance to read over the entire document. Um, currently we have policy B012. It's the existing debt reserve limits policy, debt slash reserves limit policy. It was adopted September 7th, 2010. Um, we are going to try to focus that on this policy as being reserves only. Uh, debt limits should be separate and written in context of its own policy at a later date. Um, with B012, um, we're refocusing to speak separately to reserve solely and separate policy to the debt uh, limits just because of them being quite uh, different. Yes, they're used in for the same nature, but um, very different in in uh, what they, how they should be written. Um, um, at a high level, the draft reserve policy is intended to provide a forum for council um, to describe its expectations, ensure that the municipal, municipal money is well managed and controlled 
and spent only as approved by council. Additionally, the policy sets the standard of reporting uh, that council wishes to see well, in an accurate and timely fashion. Um, it must be noted that Alberta municipalities have several le legislative purposes. Um, we must provide service, facilities, and other things that, in the opinion of council, are necessary or desirable for the municipality. Um, so, therefore, there is uh, many many things to purchase, construct, um, operate, and maintain. Uh, that is a, a big part of uh, the whole process with reserves is maintaining the infrastructure that we have currently as well, as we just spoke about as well with the um, utility um, CCC model. In the past, a lot um, there hasn't been as much focus on asset management, but it's coming to a point where it's needed. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about the infrastructure that we might have, we might have small uh, pieces of equipment to multi-million dollar assets. Um, so there are multiple ways um, of paying for these assets and of a, to be a few would be debt, revenue generated, or setting aside a portion of your revenue to save for larger um, projects. Um, so the most common and viewed as a, um, best practice is to gradually set aside a small portion um, so that you can focus on new infrastructure as well as replacement of the current infrastructure. This is because municipalities have limited revenue sources, primarily taxes, user fees or levies, and grants provided by other levels of government. And we also have a limited avail avail uh, sorry, ability to take out debt on large scale projects as you know, that um, municipalities are limited to accumulating debt in the amount of 1.5 times their prior year revenue. Um, this approach minimizes the use of financing, which then allows municipalities to stay within debt limits and ultimately saves the municipality taxpayer money by reducing interest costs. Um, reserves or restricted surplus, again, is a best practice and is a responsible and proactive approach. Reserve funds should not be perceived as a measure of the municipality's wealth, as it may be a product of many years of saving and advanced planning to fund projects identified in the municipality's long-range capital plan. Uh, the MGA does not specify any requirements or restrictions related to accumulating or managing reserves. However, many uh, councils will set aside a uh, portion of their revenues for, into these reserves as uh, they see fit. And uh, they are also within policy established reserves are funded and they're established on how reserves are funded and also how the withdrawals will occur on those reserves. All of that occurs generally through the budget process. So again, reserves are an effective tool to support municipal planning um, and asset management. Uh, it's really important that we're thinking about assets throughout their entire life cycle. And rather than making sudden financial decisions supported by borrowing, reserves require municipalities to think ahead and consider when a certain asset may need to be replaced, expanded, or built for the first time to meet an um, emergency emerging service need. An important aspect of asset management is making the long-term budgeting decisions with service levels and asset deterioration in mind, not preparing for the inevitable repair or replacement of the deteriorating assets through the use of reserves could lead to a crisis situation, leaving limited funds available and forcing uh, to borrow heavily or increase taxes and significantly or also significantly reducing um, service levels as an alternative motion motive. Um, I must say that uh, the biggest thing in um, reserves is that ignoring municipal expenses or liabilities only tells one story. 
core financial financial planning. Reserves are an indication of council's commitment to ensuring a healthy community with a plan for a bright future. In other words, reserves should not be viewed as that wealth for the municipality, but rather the opposite. The money is essentially already spent and is restricted for specific use and future use. The reserves can also accumulate interest prior to being used, which it has not been a practice as, um, as of late. Um, so that is also written up into the policy itself. And that is um, the beginning of uh, our discussions surrounding the reserves policy. As you can see, attached are the current debt reserve policy, which we would like to rescind. They are quite um, um, small in nature, so you can um, go past those quite quickly. And into the new reserve policy, where we talk about the policy statement, the purpose, the guiding principles, uh, the financial reporting that would be provided, um, being that we would um, report twice, at a minimum at twice annually, as well as uh, with the consolidated financial statements, the responsibility of council, the CAO, as well as for the director of finance and administration and some definitions to, to review. And that is it. And I open now to council. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mrs. Malchuk, councillors, with the information you have in front of you and presented, are there any questions that you might have? Okay, while well, we're waiting, uh, the mayor would like to speak. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor Kimoda. I appreciate um, the new policy. Imagine an old policy being made. Yes. Um, so I, I, I like um, how this is structured and where it's going, but I do have some questions about the draft reserve policy. In the policy statement itself, the fourth bullet is to enable property tax and utility levy stabilization. So that would be, I take it, a new reserve, but we would anticipate seeing a description of that reserve in Schedule A, and so we wouldn't be approving this policy until after we get Schedule A. Is that, is that fair? Uh, yes, that is completely correct. It would be new, and you would be seeing the schedule prior to approving this full policy. Uh, there's lots of newness with that will come within the schedule as well. Okay, so I, I just want to confirm, we had a similar discussion earlier today about procedures versus policy, but the schedule will be in fact part of the policy, not part of the procedures. Is that right? So it, it is within our lane. Um, yes, um, because Council um, ultimately is the um, body which sets the, the reserve and what it will be used for, the amounts that will be going in within the budget. Um, and um, yes, I, I do believe it would be part of the policy, not the administrative procedures, just because it is um, how Council would like to see that those funds used in the future being for whether it's infrastructure or um, fleet or as mentioned before, the the um, stabilization, whatnot. Right. Thank you for that. I'm gonna continue just a few other observations. Um, under definitions, um, the first one, financial reserve, although that might be a description, I just don't find that it, it is a definition. I mean, all the definitions typically say, means something um, that is a hammer is an effective tool for banging the nail but it doesn't really define a hammer so I, I don't know whether we even need it at all um, there is under capital reserves um, 
the word unrestricted net assets. And I know that we have in the past talked about restricted and unrestricted reserves. Is there any intent to have any unrestricted reserves? And if so, then it seems to me that we need a definition for what unrestricted reserve means is a the definition section now is lacking, but the only place I find unrestricted is in that definition of capital reserve. So I, I don't know what the answer is, but if we're going to use that word and it has some meaning, then I think we should define it. A smaller item under restricted as a definition means a reserve operating with capital of money that can only be used for specific purposes. I think each reserve is a, a specific purpose. And so I think that it wouldn't be for specific purposes, plural, but just a specific pur purpose. So each reserve is restricted to some purpose. Unless of course it's unrestricted, but you haven't defined. And again, the definition of reserves um, it starts with are created when I think that a definition should be written that reserves means a fund set aside designated for future purposes rather than are created by. And the final question I have is with respect to reserves under the existing administrative procedures for bylaw 012. We have a reserve minimum of $2 million. Is it intended, um, if we rescind that bylaw, that goes, is it intended to replace it? Is it necessary to replace it? Or will it just be silent? Deputy Mayor, through to your worship. Um, yes, so that. Um, minimum amount will be seen in the schedule provided. So definitions of the reserves themselves as well as minimal um, optimal balances that we would that council would like to see within those reserves. Thank you for that. I, I will only then suggest that there be some wording to reflect what that minimum reserve amount means. Because I, I struggle personally with a minimum, we always have to have a minimum of $2 million. That means that we couldn't get into that $2 million. It's, it's supposed to be there as a, as a hedge against disaster of some sort, financial disaster. But if you have to have a minimum, then you can't use that minimum potentially ever. And so what's the point of having the minimum if you can't use it? So I I think we should sort out what we mean. We've always thought that yes, we should always have a savings account. But if the savings account always has to have a minimum balance, then you can't ever go below that. So that first two million you can never use. I'd mm -hmm. like to see us take a shot at expressing what, what it is we really mean. And it, it's good to have the savings account, but it's of no value if we can never get into it. Yeah, I get I guess what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Because when you get to two million, that's actually zero for us as far as our savings goes, because we're required to have that. And so we but we have nothing to dip into. So essentially we don't have a reserve there. We have savings you can't touch. That's right. Yeah. I don't want to get too deep into specifics and in, into different departments or anything, but I remember uh, prior to even being in this building, the uh, council at the time we discussed uh, fleet management and reserves for that. And because of the dynamics, see, we talked about uh, you made reference to to assets and some of them being small and some of them being big. And then 
Um, there was differentiation to fleet because of the complexities there, where in the vehicles and, and all sorts of things. And then we went into the discussions about whether it's better to rent in some areas or lease and, and buy straight up. So that, that dynamic in itself, I, I think we were developing a system at the time to take care of all that. And um, has there any been any more thought into um, having a fleet reserve for the municipality in general, as opposed to different departments? Um, yes, Deputy Mayor, um, there is going, or the plan is to bring forward a reserve for fleet. Um, now, um, as it would be seen, would be an entire fleet, but I, for job costing wise and what is necessary for each department, there there is a very important part of, you know, uh, one department not um, not contributing too much, and then having another department um, pull all of the the reserves that was contributed by a different department. So just in the aspect of keeping it in alignment with what um, you require for that department um, in the fleet nature. For instance, administration doesn't really need much in the fleet sense, but um, operate or operations and um, and uh, protective services do. So it, it only makes more, it makes sense for them to contribute more to that reserve than say administration would um, because they will need more. Um, and having it, it will in essence go to one great big pop, but in the background, there'll still be for, for me as, as budgeting and planning um, going into looking into the future that would be still segregated out and planned for. Thank you. And, you know, it wasn't my intent to get into more of a budgetary discussion, but I just, I didn't know if certain things need to be addressed within the reserve policy or as, you know, it, we're not intending to get into the specifics of those, but there are some dynamics of our overall operation that are different from others. Right. And the schedule will um, restrict the reserves more so um in their use and how they're they're um um fed basically as well all right thank you councillors councillor Mona. thank you deputy mayor Mona. um I, going back to your reference to schedule a um do you have a feel for how many reserves we might be looking at are we looking at a list of about 20 or 18 and, and I appreciate your comments, especially around the fleet discussion, where uh, protective services and specifically the replacement of fire trucks need to be done on a scheduled basis. Legislatively, we need to make sure that funds are timed to when trucks have to be replaced. So hence, probably a restricted reserve. But just to, to help us, as I see the five, six points here, how reserves are going to be defined. Um, I, I'm anticipating between all the different departments that we'd be looking at, like I say, probably 15 different reserves, named reserves. Um, once again, my uh, deputy mayor, through Councillor uh, Melnick, um, my computer VPN has crashed, so I can't bring up the document that I was trying to bring up to give you a specified amount, but um, definitely probably in the 15 to 25, um, being that we're, we will be focusing more on asset groups as well. Um, on the back end of things, I will see a lot more of those when it comes down to budgeting and planning. Um, but yes, probably in that 15 to 25 range. Um, I do have a start on it, and it, but I can't open it at the moment. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, you too. If uh, we have no further questions, would someone other than the mayor like to make a motion today? Other than, I know you made one. Just saying. <laughs> I made the reference to quarterback earlier, and if I had to remove myself to make a motion uh, to relinquish the chair for a bit, I will. But uh, we have three other very capable counselors. Does anyone want to? 
take a stab at this. There's some low hanging fruit here. Okay. All right. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I can take a stab at this motion. That committee received the draft reserve, reserve policy as presented and as, as amended with comments you've heard in our discussion. Is that good? With amendments as discussed at the Committee of the Whole, October 11, 2022. I think he's ever. I like the ever evolving motions. <laughs> Works great. Ms. Acorn, did you uh, get that? I, I will continue on and direct administration to return to a future Committee of the Whole with Schedule A reserve decisions as discussed at Committee of the Whole in October 2022. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's an all encompassing motion with the two points and the amendments direction. Everyone understand? All in favor? That's scary. I did pause, Captain. Okay, uh, any more discussions on a reserve policy? Any comments before we move on to um, potentially agenda item eight? I don't believe, uh, has any, has Councillor Wilson asked anybody to discuss the clean energy improvement program? Do you have some information on that? Ms. Adam? Thank you, Deputy Mayor DeMota. I do not have information from Councillor Wilson, but uh, Ms. Robbins, who was here earlier today, said she had some information uh, that she could forward us on email about the program and that um, it is for businesses to apply to. So we can um, be sure to forward that to Council and Councillor Wilson may choose to raise this again at an upcoming meeting, but okay. that's what I wanted to share. Councillor Hall. Yes, I, I did hear from Councillor Wilson that we, he's happy to have it deferred to the next committee okay. of the whole, maybe with that information. Okay. Thank you, Director Nadell. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Um, having what was that your hand? Your uh, having no further discussion on that, I'd like to move on to agenda item eight, the motion to action list. Um, Ms. Nadell, do you have anything to change here or? Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I would suggest that. The longest standing item on the motion action list can be struck out and, and replaced by the new direction that uh, Council provided today. So that first item uh, dated September 14, 2021, S block to be removed, as well as um, the recreational use of municipal outdoor facilities. Um, again, new direction arising from Council today, but that this August 9, 2022 item can be struck out. And I believe that does it, unless the, the last one would be utility model review outcomes. Maybe again to strike out and replace with the new motions from today would be the third one, which is the last item on the motion action list. Great. And just for clarification, um, having those changes, we will see as far parking come back on here with a different uh, motion description and a different target date. And those target dates are to be recommended on what administration feels that they can accomplish those by. Okay, that's great. So, when we have a motion regarding S-block parking, the removal of S-block parking, the outdoor recreation facilities policy, and the third one was the utility rate models of Correct? Yes. If I, if I may, so the motion would be to um, approve the motion action list 
with the amendments as presented. Yeah, I'm waiting for someone to do that. <laughs> Council Baxter. All right. Sorry, do you need me to say it or is it? That's hard. <laughs> no, I don't. I just like to hear your voice. So there we go. You can hear us. We can hear you. Um, I'll call the question. All in favor? That's Carrie. Thank you for that. So nice to have you here. All right. That brings us on to uh, Councillor Upcoming Meetings. Who would like to report? First, council appointments to boards and committees. Your worship. I have um, two matters, Deputy Mayor Demora. Thursday of this week is a meeting of the West Yellowhead Regional Waste Management Authority Board. Councillor Wilson and I sit on that. I am Going to be unable to attend. Typically, these meetings are on Wednesdays, which is it works with my schedule. This Thursday does not. I'm not sure whether we have an alternate designated for that particular committee. Um, and I don't seem to have access to the internet right now, so I can't check the appointment schedule that's embedded in. Or again, there is no alternative. Uh, well, I will. I will try and confirm with Councillor Wilson that he at least will be there. Uh, Mr. Gibbon often attends as well, but he's away this week. But he might designate somebody for him. The second thing I would like to draw to Council's attention in terms of upcoming meetings. Of course, we have the organizational meeting. Um, Two weeks from today, following committee the whole, there may be um, a desire at that meeting to add two new assignments. Um, I have discussed with Mr. Gibbon, and I'm not sure whether we've received it yet, but we're anticipating at least an invitation from Arts Canada to appoint a counselor to the Indigenous Forum. Um, so we, if we're going to do that, we should regularize it with a motion at the organizational meeting, um, and then I can make the appointment. So if somebody can come prepared with a motion to add the Indigenous Forum as important, the Jasper National Park Indigenous Forum, and similarly with whatever councillor Melnick discussed early on this morning, the Rural Renewal Initiative screen, I think, if, if we're going to make an appointment, there is the necessity of having a motion at the organization meeting to add that committee to our structure. Um, so I will invite any counselor to be prepared for that. And if there are any other committees or boards where counselors think we should have representation, then I invite counselors to come to the organizational meeting prepared to make a motion to add other appointments to the list. And if you want an email, send an email. Like these internal love jobs. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. I'm. Uh, I'll be. Looks like the other counselors are formulating some things. I'm. Uh, on behalf of our uh, counselor Keller Rappi, I'm uh, attending the community conversations tomorrow as an alternate uh, for early childhood. Or early learning in childhood. That uh, daycare, so child care. <laughs> they only had early uh early on. And I do believe that 
Oh, no. Okay, that's fine. I'll defer to other counselors. Councilor Nunn. I uh, would just like to report that I attended the community conversations um, for seniors last Wednesday as the alternate and um, it was a very productive meeting, well attended. And uh, there is, uh, I think, some good um, positive uh, communication going on through these, through our various community conversations that just would encourage individuals to participate and, and monitor to participate in anyone that they have any interest in. Um, it certainly is, has been great to, uh, to be involved in them and I look forward to continuing through the next year on uh, whichever community conversations we determine counselors will be on at the organizational meeting. Thank you. Councilor Nunn. Thank you, Councilor Nunn. Councillor Hall. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Last Wednesday, I also attended a community conversation, the adult one, and unfortunately brought the wrong book with my notes, but it was very well attended, probably 20 people. It was really robust conversation that we actually had to cut short because we got to the hour mark, but I do remember that the Employment Centre is happy. There are less jobs on the board and there are more international staff coming back into town, which is a huge help. So, yeah. I also do share your sentiments, Councillor Melnick. I really enjoy those conversations. Mm -hmm. Councillor Waxer. Uh, last Friday, yeah. I attended the Food Security Working Group and uh, yeah. administration from the uh, Community Development Department has uh, developed a draft presentation based on the feedback from, for, from the participants in this uh, working group. And uh, it has been distributed and so quite a bit of uh, work was done on by the group. It now goes back to the group's membership to come forward to council, uh, believe at the end of the month. So uh, it's it's been a, a pleasure to be working with this group and uh, it's wonderful to see the passion and enthusiasm of people who um, in the community who have been addressing food security for our residents. Thank you, Councillor Waxer. Any other councillors? All right. That moves us to um, agenda item 10, upcoming events. We've got the Jasper Park Chamber of Commerce General Meeting October 12th via Zoom. Uh, at 8 30 a.m. Is that strictly to Zoom or is that a Zoom option? Okay, it may be just Zoom. Um, oh, that's Wednesday, that's tomorrow, tomorrow morning. So, if anybody wants to be available for that, uh, NETMA is uh, next week, October 19th at Wicked Cup from 5 to 7 p.m. Organizational meeting on uh, the 25th, as the mayor alluded to, uh, following Committee of the Whole. That's great for another long day for me. Intergovernmental meeting, um, October 27th at 2 p.m. And then budget presentations, November 15 and 16. Um, I think there's a, a few more things happening in the community. Like on the 30th, we have uh, Nightmare on Cannot Drive um, going on from JCT. We'll have more information on that. The next meeting on that, um, as well as is there any planning going towards our Christmas party this year? We're gonna is there gonna be a in person gathering at the activity center? I'm just it doesn't have to be answered today. I'm just uh, looking forward to having something on the radar there. And what weekend we're gonna do that? So not to be done big. Um, if anybody, if no one else has anything to add, Councillor Mayor Aaron. Just a reminder, an email I think from Director Reed late last week about an Indigenous Partners meeting in this room tomorrow evening. 
sometime at six at five thirty. Six thirty. Six thirty. Just a reminder to council. Thank you for that. And it's not just a long day for you. I know. <laughs> I know how painful I can make it on others too. And it's not just about the people. Council Waxer. I apologize about missing the uh, Indigenous Partners meeting tomorrow evening, uh, but I think it would probably be counterproductive to have a Zoom participation at a, 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 that type of event. So uh, I would have been willing to put the time into it, but I, I don't think it's appropriate. So I. Uh, I just wanted to send my regrets. And, and uh, my regrets too. I had a previous engagement uh, for something that I'm physically organizing, so uh, I might have some difficulty attending tomorrow as well. Um, does anyone else have anything to add? Jeff, coming in? Okay. Then we can move on to 11. Do I actually need by procedure a motion? To adjourn, or can I just adjourn? We're not there yet. <laughs> all right, we're not there yet. Um, all right, and would someone like to motion to adjourn? I've been silenced. <laughs> Councilor Waxer, thank you. <laughs> we are now adjourned. At... Yeah, you have to vote on motion. Oh, sorry, we have to vote on motion. All in favor? 12.47 p.m. Thank you. Still can't be done without the mayor. That's why we love it so much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>